Good afternoon, and welcome to Conversations in Interventional Cardiology. My name is David Reisick, and I'm joining you from the Honor Health Medical Center in Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Dean Kariakis, Dr. Michael Reardon, and Dr. Susan Barron. Today, we're going to discuss a very interesting topic, a recent publication, a case report, of a J-valve transcatheter treatment of natic, native aortic valve regurgitation associated with left ventricular assist device. I'm honored to represent JSky and Dr. Alexander Lansky. You can follow us at Twitter on MyJSky or at JSky.org. That's J-S-C-A-I dot org. JSky is the home for all official Sky documents. Dean, you published this paper. I was uh, honored enough to have reviewed it. Uh, tell us a little bit. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about the case and give us a uh, brief presentation on uh, what you found when you saw this patient? Uh, you bet, David. Well, thank you very much, David. I'm going to present on uh, J-valve, which is a novel transcatheter treatment for severe aortic regurgitation patients in high risk for surgical valve replacement. But I'm going to focus on aortic regurgitation associated with left ventricular assist devices because this is a growing and unmet surgical need. Uh, these are my disclosures. I'm a consultant for JC Medical that makes J-Valve. I've never held an equity interest. I think all of us appreciate that severe aortic regurgitation accounts for about 20 to 30 percent of isolated surgical aortic valve replacements in the U.S. today and may be present concurrently in an additional 20 to 30 percent of patients that present with moderate to severe aortic stenosis. These patients are morphologically different. They may have minimal or absent cusp calcification, dilated aortic root, and ascending aorta, and this presents technical challenges to catheter-based treatment, including a suboptimal fluoroscopic visualization, insufficient anchoring and sealing of the currently available transcatheter devices, which leads to a risk of misplacement, migration, embolization, and a risk of residual valve regurgitation. We know aortic regurgitation in LVAD patients is an unmet and growing clinical need. It can be present in 15 to 50 percent of patients who are on continuous flow LVAD for at least a year, uh, and there is time dependency of occurrence for this phenomenon. Uh, Non-opening of the aortic valve is associated with the development of de novo AR. This is the disuse theory. And the mechanisms are multifactorial and include uh, leaflet deterioration, commissural fusion, aortic sinus dilation, and increased transvalve, that's aortic to ventricular gradients. Some of the references are listed at the bottom of the slide. The risk for this in LVAD patients include older age, female sex, small body size, the presence of at least mild AR at the time of LVAD implant, and continuous flow versus pulsatility have all been predictors. Moderate to severe AR is associated with adverse left ventricular remodeling and continuous flow LVAD patients that have moderate to severe AR uh, have an increased risk for hospitalization and even death. Uh, treatment of LVAD-related AR with transcatheter valves that are designed for the treatment of aortic stenosis has been uniformly associated with poor results. Well, you know, J-valve may have specific attributes that make it an attractive option for the treatment of aortic regurgitation. The short, self-expanding nitinol frame, bovine pericardial valve, and as you can see, these three anchor rings uh, that function as a landing apparatus. Uh, these uh, anchor rings facilitate commissural alignment and also anchoring and sealing of the device on the leaflets. You'll note these three sinus cutouts that correspond to the anchor rings as shown. These facilitate coronary access, but also physiologic sinus washout to prevent thrombosis. The valves available in larger sizes, including a 31 and 34 millimeter. Uh, this cartoon illustrates a valve deployment. On the right, you can see the relatively simple three-component um, control handle. The, the delivery system has a capacity to flex, very similar to the Edwards system. And here are the anchor rings being deployed in each of the respective sinuses. The valve is self-expanding, and patients maintain hemodynamic stability throughout. This is a case example of a woman treated with a 27-millimeter J-valve. We did this under conscious sedation um, with 
trance thoracic echo, uh, this woman was an exclusion from the Align AR trial because her aortic angulation exceeded 60 degrees. Now, in fact, that protocol was amended to include up to 70 degrees, uh, but as you'll see, uh, she would have been an exclusion even then. Her angulation actually is close to 90 degrees. These are the anchor rings up here at the top being deployed initially. Um, these are This is a safari wire, obviously. These are the anchor rings being snugged into the sinuses. We'll do contrast injection to demonstrate this with either multipurpose or an AL1. This is the valve being deployed. Sometimes we'll pace moderately up to 120 beats per minute, sometimes not. And this is the final result. And you'll appreciate not only the angulation of this valve, the aorta, the absence of residual regurgitation, and a low takeoff right coronary that's really not relevant when you have the sinus cutout. This is the case that we reported. This was the first case ever done with a J-valve, obviously heart made three. And this poor guy in his late 40s had had multiple uh, recurrent class four event admissions to our CVICU. You can see the uh, torrential AR, again, a safari wire. We're, we're uh, getting ready to cross the valve and put the device in. This is the final result. This case took us about 15 minutes. Honestly, we turned the LVAD down to 5,200 RPM at the time we actually put the valve in and then ramped it back up. And there's really no problem when you have the anchor rings that can lock on to these non-calcified leaflets. And this is the uh, title page of the manuscript in J. Sky. The first author is Santiago Garcia, who's our director of our structural program at Christ Hospital. Well, thank I mean, you. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful explanation. This is a phenomenal case. Why not surgery? Why not oversew the valve? Well, oversewing the valve is never a good idea because you get stagnant stagnation in the in the aorta, and it'll actually occlude the coronaries. So that is never a good idea. And surgery in and of itself, unless you're going to do a heart transplant, is generally not a good idea either. There's a reason these people have LVADs in them. And, and the biggest problem that we're starting to see now is that initially all LVADs were bridges to transplant. If this happened, you could sometimes just move ahead and do a transplant. Right. Now we're seeing these put in as destination devices that are, that are meant to stay there. And so you know, I'm sure like all of you, we have a very busy LVAD program and we tried some of the commercially available valves in these and it can take a difficult case and turn it very rapidly into an utter disaster. And so having a valve like this is designed to treat aortic insufficiency and, and comes in some larger sizes is, is, is really a godsend for surgeons like me who get asked, hey, do you want to operate on this person? And the answer is no, I'd rather have a transcatheter approach to them. Suzanne, uh, this is, uh, I found the case very interesting. Thinking of the underlying mechanism uh, with LVAD-related aortic regurgitation, is it primarily direct deterioration of the leaflets, commissural adhesions, dilation of the aorta? What's been in your experience with looking at AI uh, in relation to uh, patients with chronic LVADs? Well, I think we end up seeing it as a as a as a combination of things. And we know that as as you continue to have LVADs that are placed, the longer the patients have LVADs, the more likely they are to develop aortic regurgitation. Certainly, what I've seen in my experience is that if patient have patients have non-opening aortic valves to begin with, that they're more likely to deter uh, to, to um they're more likely to develop a significant aortic regurgitation. Um, and so from that perspective, there is some importance of having some uh, opening. I've also seen in my experience that patients who have underlying aortic regurgitation right after the LVAD is placed, so if they have moderate AR right, you know, right at the beginning, not surprisingly, those are the folks that are going to be more likely to develop a significant AR. You know, I want to echo what what Michael said that, you know, this is really wonderful to have in our toolbox um, because, you know, up until now, at least what I've used in only a couple of cases, you know, has been off-label uses of either, you know, a cribiform device or another amplatzer device. And there is never anything that feels totally good about deploying one of those devices in the aortic valve. It just feels a little wrong. So I think this is incredible to have this as, as an option for our patients. Mike, this is a self-expanding, low-profile nitinol frame with uh, bovine uh, leaflets. You've had your hands on just about every valve uh, on planet Earth. 
maybe discuss from a surgeon's perspective the attributes of the J valve, which made it ideal uh, for this particular case. Well, I, I think, unfortunately, I had the opportunity to put these in in the early EFS that Dean ran. And so we did a number of these valves. And, and the, the main attribute is the fact that you always get commissure alignment because you have to make sure that the feet go down into the cusp. And, and besides getting commissure alignment, you don't get embolization of the valve into the ventricle, which is the problem with aortic uh, insufficiency. There's nothing for the valve to grab onto. Now, once you get beyond that, it's a short self-expanding valve with coronary access. The problem with self-expanding valves is it's very difficult to make a short valve that can be reliably deployed. And because of these feet, you always get commercial alignment and you always get a reliable deployment. This would probably be a good valve for aortic stenosis, quite frankly, also, but that's not what the valve is, was designed for, but it will not surprise me if it's not being used at some point for valve and valve and even native uh, valve stenosis. Well, that, that brings up my next question, uh, Michael. Given the potential for treating aortic insufficiency with this valve, might this evolve into a broad-spectrum valve with the ability to treat a spectrum of valve pathologies, including aortic stenosis? Well, I'd personally be surprised if it doesn't, at some point, uh, start a trial where it's used in aortic I know it's been used in Europe in aortic stenosis, and it's been used you know, successfully. So these, these, this, this valve and the genovalve valve both have been used in stenosis. So it'll probably go there at some point. Now that's off label right now. And then right now the focus of the company, you know, is to get this back into an IDE trial in the United States, something that Dean's going to run for us when we get this through. And I think that once we get that going and show that it can be used in AI, you know what physicians are. Once they find a good tool, they'll look for other uses. Right, right, right. Is there any concern uh, from uh, about coronary heights, lifetime management, coronary access in the future? Well, I think there's always a concern with, with coronary access, no matter what valve you're using, whether it be a balloon expandable valve or, or any of the self-expanding valves that are out there right now. But, but the shorter you can make your valve and the more open you have your sinuses at being, and having 100% you know, commissure alignment you know, gives you your best option. As a surgeon, I have never, ever occluded a coronary putting a valve in. I mean, at least I've never left one like that. Right, right. You, can, you can see if you're going to include it and you can stop and revise it. So Suzanne, you're in your uh, TAVR board, your pre-procedure meeting. Uh, could you discuss the perceived challenges and maneuvering of implanting the valve with a functioning LVAD in place? Obviously, rapid pacing may not be needed, uh, altering the RPMs during the implant. Uh, discuss that if you would, please. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a couple of things for us to think about. First of all, you know, it's very helpful that we can, you know, ramp up and ramp down the RPMs of the LVAD at the time to really kind of slow cardiac output um, and help us to help with the positioning. I mean, I think the other thing you obviously have to worry about is, is where does that, where's that wire sitting in the LV uh, and ensuring that that's not going to end up getting uh getting getting entangled uh, in anything else. And then the last thing, and again, this is not something that we really need to worry about, as, as Michael really said, uh, you know, with this valve, we worry about coronary obstruction. And I'm thinking again, more on other off-label uses of, of other uh, implants that have been used. The other thing I'd point out, David, is the faster you run your pump, the less output there is through the valve. Right. <laughs> There's more output through, through the device into the aorta. The slower you run your pump, the more you have a, a normal ejection if you have some underlying heart function. So, you know, that's, a, I think, I think we're all trying to figure out what's the best way to put these valves in. And as long as you have feet that keep it from going into the ventricle, it probably doesn't really matter what you do. We just tend to do it because it seems good. I think as time goes on, we'll probably quit doing it, quite frankly. Dean, I, as I reviewed this paper, I was thinking from an anatomical standpoint, what other valve I may have used. Uh, but the way you describe this uh, and uh, looking at the final result. I, I don't know that you could have chosen another valve that would have been quite this ideal. Correct? Yeah. Well, you know, I'd like to make one point really clear, and I think it's very important for us to make it clear, that this was compassionate use of an unapproved device, and I want to put it right out there. Uh, there were five centers between Canada and the U.S. that all doing compassionate use that we lumped together retrospectively. There was not a prospective protocol, and in fact, the EFS is right now in front of the US FDA for approval. 
the plan for the EFS and then the pivotal IDE trial for this device. Another device, so it's this, an investigational device that was um, implanted under compassion and use, which requires CDRH approval, frankly. So uh, I would say that uh, Genovalve or Yenovalve, which we've also used and been one of the top enrollers uh, in their pivotal IDE trial, uh, has been reported in the same situation. The differences between the valves are in valve height, okay, which for the 27 Jenna is 36 millimeters, and for the 34 J valve is only 25 millimeters, and then you have the sinus cutouts. You know, a surgeon came up to me once and said, you know, God doesn't make valves as cylinders. And I never really thought about that. It takes a guy like Mike Reardon to explain that to an interventional cardiologist like me. Uh, God doesn't make cylinder valves. And this really facilitates uh, sinus washout and gives you, you can accommodate a five millimeter left main, which is nothing that we would do in any of the other valves. So one of the areas where I think there may be differential for J valve is in low coronaries. I think also maybe in bicuspids where there's a big experience in China with this, but you know we would like to do that as a single arm registry in the pivotal trial here, and maybe even valve and valve. You know, um, both. Uh, if you look at uh, 2020 uh, Jack interventions, Mark Henze, John Webb have a really interesting bench. Uh, publication where they look at mitra flow and trifecta, which are externally mounted leaflets, big problems, particularly with lower coronaries. And they put the genovalve on with its locators, and it sits up very high, relatively high, into the aortic uh, ascending aorta. And then you've got uh, J valve, which actually comes down into the previous valve and with the anchor rings really clasped down these externally mounted leaflets. So, you know, I've used the term that this could obsolete the basilica procedure, which I think many people would be glad about, frankly. Um, but I don't know that. But that's another area where we think there's a real application. Suzanne, you're the smartest of all of us, so you get the last word. What's the follow-up of this type of patient? Well, I think... You know, certainly, and I'll, I'll defer a little bit to Dean as to where, you know, where it's going with this patient. I'm guessing with his young age that he'll be uh, considered, you know, for, for transplant would be my, would be my guess uh, for him. But I think at this point, right, we're going to need to be monitoring a couple different things. We're going to need to be monitoring for development of thrombosis um, on the valve leaflets. You know, uh, we didn't talk about what sort of anticoagulation strategy we're going to be using, Dean, although I guess it doesn't really matter given the fact that he has an LVAD in place, but for patients who don't, uh, thinking about that sort of thing down the road, um, but monitoring for valve leaflet thrombosis and, and looking to see how well the valve holds up in the setting of, of an LVAD uh, hemodynamic system. I mean, this is this is one of those things that's a kind of a first in man, and so it's very exciting to be part of a discussion about it. Well, this has been a great session. Uh, we thank you for all, all of you for joining us in Conversations in Interventional Cardiology. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter on MyJSky or at JSky.org. That's J-S-C-A-I.org. JSky is the home of all official Sky documents. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. Thanks, David.